What's up, everybody? It is Izzy back again with another Q&A. Today's an off day for me, so we're going to have a little bit of an abbreviated Q&A, but let's get into the first question. First of all, and I know this is going to sound like I'm being pedantic, but I think it's important to the answer. <clears throat> whey protein is a meal replacement product. It's food. So it would be just as weird to ask someone, do you take chicken? Do you take beef? Whey, whey protein is a food. So if you're having trouble getting your protein in, whey protein is a convenience product that allows you to get your protein in. You just put it in some water and shake it up, boom, it's ready to go. You don't have to have a grill or a stove or an oven or whatever to cook the meat. So that said, no, I don't take whey protein because I get all of my protein from real food and I'm currently dieting and on a diet, I prioritize eating solid whole foods because they keep you fuller longer than liquid calories. There are some times when I am gaining weight that I will use whey proteins, but very rarely I get most of my food or most of my protein from real foods because they have better micronutrient profiles. So again, think of whey protein as something you eat, not something you take. Uh, yeah, I mean, training leg curls before you train hack squat, leg press, back squats, pendulum squats, that's a good idea. Leg curls are a relatively light isolation exercise that produce almost no systemic fatigue whatsoever. Doing leg curls before you squat has almost zero impact on your squat performance. On the other hand, exercises like squats are extremely systemically fatiguing and can decimate your leg curl performance. So it makes more sense to preserve performance across the workout, get a good hamstring stimulus and a good quad stimulus rather than get a good quad, a good quad stimulus and a pretty hamstring stimulus. It's very similar to say deadlifting before you do squats or leg press. How do you think that would affect the quality of your squats and leg press? Well, deadlift is a very systemically fatiguing exercise, right? So it has quite a big negative impact when you do squats after you deadlift. All in all, leg curling before you do your squats and leg press is a very good practice that I would recommend to most people. Uh, you should be wearing Olympic lifting shoes for almost all quad work. It doesn't matter for leg extensions, but basically anything where you are transmitting force through the bottom of your foot that requires any kind of ankle mobility, most people are going to be limited in their ability to get to depth, to have full knee flexion by their ankle mobility. In fact, Olympic lifting shoes isn't really even enough for a lot of people. You need Olympic lifting shoes with an insert. Some people even need like 30 degree squat wedges. So for any quad work that you're doing, I highly recommend you use at least Olympic lifting shoes. And on top of that, I recommend considering getting the Versa Lifts inserts to put in your Olympic lifting shoes as well. I have Olympic lifting shoes with the 1.1 inch heel, and then I put in an insert that adds another 0.75 inches. So I have almost a two inch heel, and that really helps me to get maximal knee flexion on my quad movements. And it's something I highly recommend for basically about just about everybody, unless your ankles are super, super mobile. I mean, I'm kind of offended. Am I not good enough for you? Are you telling me that the telecommuting social medicine doctor, Dr. Izzy T, is not sufficient for your primary care needs? Honestly, man, I have no idea. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're if you're natural, I guess just try to get try to look for some. I honestly, I don't even know what to tell you. The last time I went to a GP, I was probably like 15 years old, and my mom made me because I had like a fever or something. <clears throat> it's just not a, a, a regular doctor's office is not a place that I find myself very often, to be honest. So I imagine it would be more important to um, go with something that your insurance provider makes as easy and cheap and flexible as possible. So just because you take a close grip on a press, that does not automatically mean it's going to be limited by your triceps. It's still a compound movement. So there's still the possibility that you feel it mostly in your chest. The best thing that you can do is to keep your elbows as tucked as tightly as possible to your sides. Uh, from there, if you're still not really feeling it in your triceps, keep in mind your triceps are still working to extend the elbow, but maybe just pick a different exercise. Well, you've honestly not given me much to work with. I tend to order, order exercises by priority to my physique first and foremost. So if upper back is a bigger priority, do your rows first. If lats are a bigger priority, do your pull downs and pull ups first. And then from there, I tend to order things by strength curve. So if any of those are short biased, pull ups and barbell rows are both short biased. You know, a lot of a pull down may be lengthened bias or mid range bias, depending on what equipment that you're using. So I would probably do that last if you have a lengthened biased, you know, a lot of a pull down option. I feel like I already addressed this yesterday to some degree, but no, 
I'm not going to change everything just because of one comment from JP. I've added 100 pounds of body weight in the last four years or so. And obviously not all of that is lean. But the point being, what I'm doing is working. So I'm not looking to make wholesale changes off of a two-sentence exchange with somebody. No matter how much I respect who that two-sentence exchange came from. Um, I will probably still not make any changes on lifts where I'm adding reps and adding weight at the same time. <clears throat> it's really hard to want to change anything when you're progressing that fast. I don't think there's any universe where I can get to a four plate incline, let's say, for, for 10 reps and be small, no matter how little volume that I use to get there. I will be big if I can do that no matter what. So the fastest way I can get there is the fastest way to getting big. Now on exercises where I've stopped adding reps and I'm really just making that 1% micro load jump, I'm gonna be a little bit more aggressive in adding volume to those movements. Well, first step is you actually gotta pay a little bit of attention. So the reason why I'm considering making a change there is because I'm not progressing. So it's not about progressing faster, I have actually stopped progressing. When you add 1% load to a movement and you lose one rep, that is not necessarily the same as fatigue-induced progression. Now, if you added 1% and you lost multiple reps, that's a huge backslide in performance. You can almost guarantee that's because you have too much fatigue. However, if you just make a 1% jump and you lose one rep, that's just about an equivalent performance. So that's more of a stagnation than a regression. And when you're stagnating, it's possible that in order to fix the stagnation, you need to add volume to get things moving again because adding more volume can potentially cause an adaptation to take place that gets you to start making those 1% jumps again. Or you add a set and you now start losing multiple reps and you can be sure that it's fatigue. But either way, keep that in mind. My general heuristic on this is if you're stagnating, consider adding more. And if you're regressing, you're doing too much. So how should a lifter decide between losing actual muscle tissue and cutting more H2O when they're at the top of a weight class? Well, for one, once you've reached the upper limits of safety on the water cut, you really have no other choice, right? <clears throat> because now you're risking death to make weight and that's just idiotic. Now, number two, last time I took you at your word on this, this time I clicked on your profile, move up weight classes. You, <clears throat> it, this is something that powerlifters struggle with so much they get attached to this idea of a certain quality of lifter that they are. And when they look at the numbers that it would take to match that quality in the next weight class up, they get intimidated and they think that they shouldn't do it. You will be totaling approximately the same thing for the next two, three, four, five years until you do the right thing and move up. If you are a competitive male power lifter with a sub 315 competition bench, you are not in the right weight class. You're just not. I don't care what you have to say. You're not. Take it how you want, but move up. I really just don't think this is even something to worry about that much. From a, a powerlifting perspective, you should still be doing like sub-max singles on a regular basis with hook grip. I'm assuming you're a hook grip puller because I don't really think there's any other point to using straps unless your hands are just really torn up. And if your hands are really torn up, it's not like a, a common training thing. So I wouldn't worry about having the carryover be limited while your hands are torn up. But yeah, <clears throat> overall, I wouldn't think about this too much. You should still be just judging things based on your sub-maximal singles. I'm going to resist the urge to make jokes about just getting stronger instead of more flexible. But what you're going to do is when you unrack the bar, <clears throat> keep your ass in the air. Once the bar is over your shoulders in a locked out position and anchoring your traps to the bench, so they can't slide backwards. You're going to use leg drive and the direction of your leg drive is going to be towards your traps. So that is going to push your arch into its <clears throat> maximum <laughs> state of extension. And then what you're going to do while continuing to maintain leg drive towards your traps is you're going to lower your butt down to the bench as close to your shoulders as possible using your leg drive to force it closer to your shoulders. And in so doing, you should be able to set up with a maximum arch even on a self unrack bench. I don't have a video of me actually doing this. Otherwise, I would post that because I don't do that shit anymore. You know what I mean? Does 531 have too much volume because it has pre-planned deloads usually every three or six weeks? Just because a program has pre-planned deloads does not mean it uses too much volume. That is a certain style of programming. It's a very legit style of programming. Many people use it who are very big or strong in both bodybuilding and powerlifting. My style of programming is simply different. It's a minimum effective volume style, or it's closer to that anyway. And the mesocycles can last a lot longer because of that and deloads are taken as needed. If you're pushing volume as high as you can tolerate, you will need pre-planned deloads every 
three to six to eight weeks, somewhere in that range. Um, again, that said, I don't really want to talk about 531 specifically because it's a cookie cutter template. There's like 15 different options. No one runs it exactly the same way. I don't do program reviews anymore. And, you know, because no one does it exactly the same way, it's impossible to make a general comment. But again, just because a program has pre-planned deloads does not mean it does too much volume. It's a style of programming. As always, friends, if you like the video, like the video. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. Subscribe if you haven't already and enjoy the rest of your Sunday. If it's Sunday when you're watching this, that is.